Okay, everyone is now muted except myself. So firstly, welcome to everyone and especially our three presenters whom I'll introduce later during the meeting. Um, the special interest group has now reached a, the target that I originally set of 46 members. Um, and there are people on a waiting list who actually applied after we've reached the 46 members. The reason for the 46 is that in a Zoom meeting on a computer, a Zoom can only display a grid of 7 by 7 people, which is 49. So that's the 46 members plus the three presenters. And uh, initially... Lee has got her screen on. Share screen. Okay, I will stop sharing. Lee, just turn off that. Uh, okay, now no one can share. Thank you. Um, once we've settled and decided how we're going to go forward, we might reconsider this number of 46 if there are still more people interested. I will also keep track of people who attend the meetings so that everyone gets a fair chance. If, if someone is on the list of 46 but they never attend a meeting, then I think it's just fair to allow the people on the waiting list in. I'm not going to repeat all the basics of uh, Zoom, but I think for some of us who might need further guidance, I'll just explain a few of the basics. Um, the first thing is... I'm the host of this meeting, but I've got two co-hosts. I've got Mike Reynolds, who assists me as a co-host, and Professor Butler, Martin Butler, is also a co-host. So they will assist me to mute everyone, look at questions, um, admit more people in. The mute button, if you look at your Zoom meeting window, at the bottom left is a microphone icon. Now, that is where you can mute yourself. If you click on that button, it will mute your microphone. If you click on it again, it will give you the option to unmute yourself. For the sake of the meeting, I would prefer that everyone remains muted except the speaker. And if you want to ask a question, then before you speak, just remember to unmute yourself. Next to the... Um, microphone icon at the bottom left is the camera icon um, and that is where you can turn your video camera on or off now Kay did ask to save data usage um, she's going to turn her camera off it does make a difference it can make a difference I prefer to see everyone especially the way and I'll explain now how you can ask or raise a question the participants panel at the bottom, you'll see there's a few icons. There's um, share screen and then next to it, one of the buttons there is participants. That's like a toggle switch. If you click on it, it opens a panel on the right hand side, a white panel called the participants panel. And you can see a list of all the people in the meeting in that panel. It's not very important for this meeting, so you don't have to have it on. The next button there is the chat panel it's also a, a toggle switch so if you click on it once it will open the chat panel on the right hand side if you click on it again it will close the chat panel it is important for this meeting because later on i will post a link in that chat panel that you need to click on to reach certain information uh, but i will remind you again once we get there and then lastly the the view that you see to see the grid of seven by seven or up to seven by seven you need to be in the gallery view now on the top right um, there's a button that either reads speaker view or gallery view and what sounds confusing if you in gallery view that button will read speaker view because the option is to change it to speaker view i recommend that you all are in gallery view in other words that button should read speaker view the difference is if you're in speaker view you just see a band of three or four people at the top and you see the current speaker in the center dominating your screen but if you want to see everyone then 
um, the gallery view will show everyone and just shows a yellow frame around the current speaker. What we've also said about the questions, if you want to ask a question, there's many ways that you can do it in Zoom, but we've preferred the old method, the same as what that if you are in a meeting. So just raise your hand, keep it raised in front of your face until I or the co-host attend to you. And then I will ask you to unmute yourself and just you can start to speak. Also, just a reminder, during our previous test sessions, um, you can remember that the free version of Zoom has got a limitation of 40 minutes for meetings with more than two participants. Now, I can tell you from experience, um, it can be very disruptive and inconvenient to restart the meeting every 40 minutes. Now, today we are very fortunate and grateful that the University of Stellenbosch Business School made one of their Zoom rooms available for us um, for today as well as for the September meeting. Now this means that we do not have a 40 minute limit and the meeting can be completed without any disruptions. Thank you very much to Professor Butler who arranged this for us. Just to continue on that, the cost of a licensed Zoom is about 15 US dollars per month, which is roughly 265 rands per month. It is billed annually in advance, which means for a one year license, it will cost about 3,180 rand. Now, if we are 45 committed members of the group, it will work out roughly 71 rand per member per year. And we as a group need to decide whether we want to go that route. And you'll get a short survey at the end of the meeting, which will allow you to cast your vote on that decision. In the survey, you will also have the opportunity to rate the meeting overall, as well as rating the different presenters. Yes, Derek and Martin, we're going to rate you. Um, the survey will also act as a register of members present today. I will not be sending out minutes of the meeting. However, the meeting is being recorded and um, we can use it, possibly use it for by this group, the recordings. I will keep you informed about that. Okay, there's someone's mic is still unmuted. Trish? Okay, sorry, I will mute those people now. <laughs> okay, are there any questions now with this um, before we continue with the presentations? Okay, the, the we start our, this is historical, the first meeting of this special interest group. And um, the information today is mostly about the third industrial revolution. Now the first presenter, Professor Butler, will explain what the third revolution was all about. And Derek will then explain some of the technical terms that originated during this third industrial revolution. As a dessert afterwards, Magrit will join us to discuss some of the current platforms for social media, which I'm sure many of you will be interested in. There will be a, an opportunity for questions at the e uh, end of each topic. So during the presentation, I'll ask you to just keep your questions. And at the end of the presentation, I will uh, allow time and then you can raise your hand and ask a question. Um, I will also, at the end of the meeting, you've seen the agenda, I will present a practical technology tip, something that offers value in your everyday use of your computer. And I've titled that series, I didn't know that I can do that. And hopefully what I can show you there is something that you did not know.
Um, I sent out Professor Butler's impressive CV with our newsletter earlier this month. And in summary, I can say that he has extensive qualifications and practical experience in the information technology industry. He's a very busy man with great responsibilities in his role as head of the business school's teaching and learning program. And yet, he's so passionate and enthusiastic about his field of expertise that when I approached him for his talk, he had no hesitation to accept. Martin also told me that the most important part of his CV is that he's the father of two children, He's got a wonderful wife and he loves Pinotage wine. So I look forward to your presentation, Martin, and now it's over to you. Thank you, Johan. Um, good morning from my side. Um, Johan might just, uh, just keep an eye on Maureen. Um, Maureen Bob, I needed to, to mute her every 10 seconds. She's really very keen to contribute ver verbally as well. So, Thank you. Um, I, I've been given 15 minutes this morning to tell you about the third industrial revolution. Um, the only reason I'm actually here is that Johan is going to share that tip at the end that says I didn't know I can do that. So, so I need to do the presentation to get to the end to also learn from Johan. Um, but I want to start off by asking you a question and you're more than welcome to type in the chat. Um, but you can actually unmute. For those of you, you can unmute and you can tell me. And the question that I have for you this morning is a, is a fairly simple one. The question is, um, what is that? What are, what, are, what are you currently looking at? So unmute, speak, shout, type in the chat. But I would like to know, um, what are you currently looking at? Okay. Thank you, Louise. That's all I need. No. Thank you, Liz. No. Trish, no. thank you. Uh, it's always, always, tool. <laughs> ah. A cell phone. <laughs> so I've had communication tool, I've had cell phone, I've got a couple of things, thank you so much. Um, of course you are all correct, but I need to make you wrong in order for this to work. Um, because the reality is that um, I woke up this morning and it wasn't my alarm clock and neither the, the watch on my wrist. Uh, the first thing that many of us read this morning was not <clears throat> the Caledon Enterprise or the Burger or the Longo Viet Club, um, but it was probably an article on News24 or CNN or BBC or whatever app we use. The last time that you were looking for something, um, yesterday, the day before or the day before that, or you ventured out in the dark or beneath your bed or into the cupboard, you didn't necessarily reach for your mobile for the flashlight, you read, reached for your mobile phone. Um, Last time you needed to get somewhere, um, somewhere physical, the world we had prior in March, um, we didn't necessarily dig out our road atlas or we used our GPSs that we all bought 15 years ago. We just asked Google or Waze how to get to our particular direction. The last bank transaction we did, um, for many of us, that could be on our mobile phone or on our computer. The last time that you communicated with anybody, um, the message that reached you yesterday that Cyril Ramaphosa was going to lock down on alcohol sales again that sent everybody to the bottle store. Um, <laughs> was that a letter that you received in the post box or was it a WhatsApp message that you got onto your phone? The last camera that you took, uh, apologies, the last picture that you took, um, the last picture that, you, that you've seen, was it um, a picture of a child or a grandchild um, that was seen in the mail or in a photo album or was it a picture that was seen taken on a mobile phone and sent on a mobile phone as well. And uh, the last video that we've watched, um, whether it's fear mongering on WhatsApp about things going wrong or right, or a humorous clip that somebody has shared with us, um, was it on television or was it on a mobile phone? And, and, and that's the reality of the third industrial revolution. The third industrial revolution meant that yes, um, it is indeed a mobile phone. Um, but it is so much more than a mobile phone. And I have another 20 slides that I can use like this, but then it will consume the entire session because our mobile phones have become central to our lives. And, and we all know that if Charles Darwin is correct with evolution, the next generation will be born with these long, elongated thumbs because they're sitting the entire day and they are ticking on their mobile phones. That's just their, their, their portal um, into life. But the reality is that um, 
technology and, and transformation technologies is not necessarily new. Um, whether it's Henry Ford building a Model T Ford or the typewriter, um, Gutenberg's printing press, the steam engine, um, the precursor of the mobile phone, computers, reading machines. Um, all of these technologies have, have changed the world around us. And when Johan asked me to speak about the third um, industrial revolution, I was initially slightly taken aback because this evening I'm speaking about digital transformation and the fourth industrial revolution to all our alumni across Africa. Uh, why would you then speak about the third revolution? And I actually enjoyed prepping for this session because um, it, it reminded me that quite often in life um, things are building upon each other. And I think a lot of the lack of insight in the current fourth industrial revolution and where we are heading is because people don't necessarily understand what happened in the first, second, and then specifically within um, the third industrial revolution. So if you allow me, I will give you a very quick technological perspective, then I will give you a quick economic perspective, and then I've got two questions and two articles um, that I would gladly share with you afterwards that I think is actually a fairly good and an interesting read. The one article is, is, is very academic, but it's written by uh, Carlota Perez, which is um, one of the people that I admire most and a bit of a mentor for me in technology. Um, and the other article is actually from, from the Wharton School. And it's a lovely article to read because I think it was written in a, in a non-technical or non-complicated -com manner. So, so firstly, a, a technological perspective. Um, and it's interesting if you look at this table from, from Carlota Perez, she's a Brazilian academic and very well known in the field of, of technology futures. What she argued is that the world has seen really five um, transformations in technology. And, and this was prior to Charles Schwab a couple of years ago coining the term the fourth industrial revolution. So even be, before we got to the fourth industrial revolution, when the economists were talking about three industrial revolutions, from a technological perspective, we actually had our eyes on five transformations. So she talked about the initial industrial revolution, then the age of steam and railways, electricity and engineering, oil synthesis, and then information and, and communication technologies. And, and what is interesting to observe here is about a 30 year time span, 20 to 30 years time span, 30 years, then 20 years, then 40 years, then 20 years again. So to a large extent, um, this article of uh, initially when she came up with the table, it was actually in 2002. And, and I think we could say to an extent, um, the first technological revolution has probably come to fruition. And a lot of the cutting edge developments that we are seeing at the moment, um, we, we would actually bundle into, into the fourth industrial revolution. A really interesting perspective on all of this um, is, is probably one of the best um, persons to break down the silos between technology um, and economy and, and actually had a very strong leg into security and warfare and the welfare of nations was Nikolai Kontrabi. Um, passed away many, many years ago and initially a lot of his work was not um, consumed in the West because it was, it was written in Russian. Uh, but Kontradiv, um at the turn of the previous century already defined what he called um, long cycles. And he says that in the world we see these economic cycles of prosperity, recession, depression and improvement. And he, he then coined the phrase the long cycles. Um, the best initial article is Garvey. I've got the hyperlink in the end. It's a very technical read. Um, but that article from 2011 is actually a really interesting perspective uh, on the work of, of Contradiv. So the, the point I'm trying to make from the technological perspective is, is if you only look at technologies that has changed the world, um, there are actually multiple technologies and there are probably a lot of technologies that are changing the world around us at the moment. So when we talk about um, the fourth or the third or the fourth industrial revolution, it's slightly more of an economical perspective um, on the world and how the structure of the economy has changed. Um, because quite often these technologies um, happen, or changes in technology happen within an economic life cycle, or it could actually span um, multiple economic life cycles. Changing our attention into an economic perspective, if we look from an economic point of view, um, this is a slightly modified version of um, the original article from Charles Schwab, which coined the term um, the fourth industrial revolution. 
And the argument here was that the first industrial revolution that everybody's really comfortable with, because the phrase was coined, was really mechanization and water and steam power. Um, the second industrial revolution, mass production, and then the third industrial revolution, um, computer and automation. And on the 30th of September, um, we will actually speak about, or we will have an interesting session on um, the fourth industrial revolution. So let's quickly turn our attention to, to um, the third industrial revolution, although I will touch briefly on the first and the second. E economists are normally um, concerned with welfare. Um, there are many multiple indicators, but um, probably one of the most common used, and I think fairly well understood um, by most individuals, is the GDP per capita. So, so, so um, there's only so much if I have a cake, um, the cake has a particular size, and depending on the size of the cake and the amount of the people in the party, that's the amount of cake I can distribute. If I have a large cake and there's two people, we can all get a lot of cake. If I have a small cake and there's two, 200 people, we each get a couple of crumbs. And the concept of GDP per capita then says is, what is the wealth that we create in the economy, and what is the amount of people that need um, to consume that wealth? A, a lot of us last year heard that Nigeria um, now has an economy bigger than South Africa, which by certain measures is true, but the population is three times larger, so the GDP per capita in, on, in, on average people are a third as wealthy in Nigeria as an average in South Africa because of the larger capita. And the question then that economic, uh, economists then ask is, so what happened when the GDP per capita globally um, changed as it did? A perspective that I particularly enjoy because I, I have a keen eye on agriculture and I think a lot of the interesting things are happening in agriculture is, is the economics uh, um, movement of where people were employed. If you go 200, 300, 400 years ago, everybody was employed in agriculture. That was the reality of the world that we were in and the world was driven by agriculture. What we have seen because of the Industrial Revolution is that um, today in a country like England, for example, only 1.2% of people are employed in all of the facets of, of agriculture, um, whereas financial services and tourism would have a fundamental role. It's quite interesting though, agriculture are one of the strongest in the industries to emerge from the COVID crisis at the moment, where many other industries to profounding um, agriculture seem to be, be very resilient. But that's the, the economic perspective then on the third industrial revolution. If we look very quickly at the first industrial revolution, or as it was known at that stage, the industrial revolution. Now we talked about the first world war, they talk about the great war, until there was a second one. So when people talk about the industrial revolution, they talk about the age of steam and how steam actually changed as a form of energy, both transportation, but a lot of manufacturing as well, and a lot of the way in which um, work was done was performed by steam engines. The second industrial revolution was strongly around a new form of energy, electricity and gas, and it means we could manufacture steel on demand and we started with chemical synthesis and, and interesting methods of communication. So sometimes we think that communication is unique to the third industrial revolution, which it's not, because many of the precursors of modern communication, like the telegraph and the telegram, do you remember going to the post office and getting the telegram about a new baby being born, um, those were all artifacts from the second industrial revolution. It was not until um, we had computers, and here we're talking 1960-ish. Um, some observers say 68, 69. I'm a 68 baby, so I'd love it to be 68. Um, I think in South Africa, probably um, from the early 70s, and it means that there was a whole host of calculation communication technologies and that allowed us to go to space to investigate in biotechnology, materials technology. So many of, many of the things that we have today, we can buy a vehicle with a Kevlar body or carbon fiber was because of the ability to communicate, to um, calculate, and um, computers became um, immensely powerful and it can do a lot of things. For me, um, the defining factor of the third industrial revolution is the rise of near zero marginal cost. And, and what we mean by zero near marginal, marginal cost is an example of what we're doing now. Um, the real cost for me to deliver um, this particular session, um, I have a little bit of an opportunity cost and a real cost and a little bit of bandwidth, but whether we do it for 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 or 1,000 people, 
and the marginal cost is really, really small. If we needed to do this in person, the difference between a room for 10 people, 40 people, 500 people, 2,000 people is fundamental and the structure of that is fundamental. And, and what the third industrial revolution due to the communication and the computational abilities gave us is the ability to reduce the marginal cost for many products and services um, significantly. If we, if we just think about what we, the ability we have today to consume media and many services, to do our banking, to speak to people, to have a live video call, and the, call of the, the cost of that um, compared to what was the norm just 20 and 30 years ago has fundamentally changed. And I think that for me is people quite often focus on the technological side and when you talk about the fourth industrial revolution, you'll pick it up in terms of the exponential growth on the technology side. Um, but it's on the economic side that it's really, really interesting how the third industrial revolution has, has really changed the world, the world around us. Wrapping up, two questions and two articles. The first question is, is changes in technology always widely embraced? I think that's a rather important question. And the second one, is it always applicable and does it always improve the situation? There's two articles, the hyperlink, I will make this available to Johan afterwards. The welcome to the third industrial revolution is much more comprehensive than what I have just said. I think it's a lovely view if you're intrigued from the economic perspective. And then that article from Carlotta Perez, I will distribute that to Johan as well, technological revolutions. If you're more from a technological perspective and you would like to understand that, um, I would highly recommend that, although it's a more technical read, it's a fascinating read um, because it also um, crosses the boundary from uh, technology to the economic. So I'd like to wrap up with the two questions. Um, is technology always widely embraced? Is it always changing society for the better? And does it always include every situation? So I, I think what we sometimes forget is that when Gutenberg invented the printing press, there was a whole outcry because the clergy within the Roman Catholic Church said this, you should never print books. It is horrible to think that the common person could actually learn to read and consume media and all of these things you're going to create a world and a society of which we have absolutely no control. Um, please go away. Uh, and some of the initial printing presses were destroyed. And um, people said that you, you, you're creating a future that is bad for world and for humanity. Today, we look at Wittenberg and we say, thank you for creating the printing press and democratizing information. At that stage, it was not um, necessarily the same. And the same is true then for the, the third industrial revolution technology that is changing the world around us. Not always for the better, we see some of the social structures and problems. Um, I've got children that are 21 and 23, and I always jokingly tell them that um, I grew up in an area when you broke a relationship, you went to the young lady and you said, it's not you, it's me, can we still be friends? So we, we develop the social skills to do a breakup and to deal with human beings. These days, the teenagers, if they end the relationship, they say WhatsApp and say, we are no longer the case. And, and they, they, they are devoid of breaking or, or of developing the social skills that is required to operate in an awkward environment and in difficult circumstances which they may face for the next 30 or 40 years with, within the business environment. And then finally, um, is technology always the best thing? Um, not necessarily, um, and I will allow this 30 second video um, to speak for itself. Emma. Huh? Emma. 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 <laughs> Clearly, um, many of the things around us have a great future, including paper. Um, I think technology has changed the world for the better. The third industrial revolution and the power of computing means that we have these mobile devices in our hands. Um, we can do marvelous things. Um, we have the ability to use Zoom to communicate. Um, but I also think um, that it always needs to be balanced with the solid dose of the realism and what is happening to society and the economy around us, and we need to balance that really well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Martin. Um, I think there's a lot of 
uh, food for thought in there. Um, a lot of academic things we have to process, but thank you very much. Okay, anyone with a question, just raise your hand um, and then we'll attend to you. Everyone is... Annette, you can speak, just unmute yourself. I didn't see Martin at all. Is that part of the uh, presentation or did I do something wrong? It could be that you're not in gallery view, like I've explained. Oh. If you look at the top right, there's a button there that either reads speaker view or gallery view. If it reads gallery yes. view, then you are in speaker yes. view. Um, so, yes, speaker view. does it read speaker view? Yes. No, then, then you are in gallery view. Um, I think he was just mixed somewhere in between. At the, um, okay. Yeah. Any other question? Uh, Bernard, just unmute yourself. Yeah, I just was wondering at what phase are we in the uh, fourth industrial revolution now? You had that phase of prosperity, then going into recession, depression. What phase are we in now? Bernard, yeah, it's a very interesting question and like many of these things in, in foresight, we know, we know in hindsight where we have been. So we, we only understand our relative position five or ten years behind the time. Um, in terms of the, uh, the concrete wave, we, we are probably um, on the beginning of the upslope. So we, we are starting to see um, the value emerging from the fourth industrial revolution. A lot of people are saying that um, the, the distribution of that value um, is, a, is a significant problem because of the capital investment that is required. So although we are seeing globally elements of the, the gain, the economic prosperity is emerging, um, it's not necessarily widely dispersed um, in industry in general. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Okay, one more question if there's anyone else. Good. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. And um, as he also referred to, and I'll speak about it at the end again, that we will listen to Martin again at the next meeting where he uh, will... Yeah. Yeah, sorry, Kristen had a hand up. Say again, who? Yeah, I had my hand up. Oh, sorry, Krista. Sorry, I didn't see that. You're welcome. Okay, people, thank you. Thanks for the questions and the answers. Um, and once again, Martin, thank you.
technology infrastructure uh, within those two organizations that Johan discussed. And, um, and Johan asked me to quickly uh, just run through a couple of things and in short just explain to you what it means when, when IT people uh, speak to each other. Sometimes it can be confusing, there's a lot of terminology used. Um, and uh, so let's let's get going um, and see if I can uh, hopefully not confuse you more. Uh, my background is technical, it's uh, not lecturing as Martin's is. And um, I hope that by the end of this you have uh, less questions and, and not more. So uh, let's get going. So just a little fun fact. Um, IT people are, are obviously uh, or often described as nerds. Uh, by the way, the word nerd was allegedly first published by Dr. Zeus in 1950 um, in a book titled I Ran the Zoo, which to me is quite appropriate um, when I think at my career and how things have gone wrong over the years. Um, <laughs> so you, as a, as a member of, of, of this group, uh, are ready for your Zoom meeting, uh, you walk up to your computing device, whatever it is, a desktop, a laptop, and uh, and you push the power button. And uh, then this happens. It says unbootable boot volume. So there's a lot of, of stuff in that, in that blue screen that you see there. IT guys call that a blue screen of death, uh, also known as BSOD. Uh, there's a lot of acronyms in IT. So what do you do? You phone your niece who works in the TV section of Macro uh, because you think he'll be able to assist you. Um, other than, than asking you about what message was that you got, um, your niece then wants to know whether you've actually attempted this solution. And you confirm that you have uh, twice or three times and you keep getting the same result. <laughs> so that's it. That's as far as your niece could assist, and uh, he then suggests that you phone the call center. So you phone the call center. Uh, the phone rings. You listen to the recorded message. The elevator music starts. Uh, a voice comes up that says, your call is important to us. <laughs> and your blood already starts boiling. Eventually an agent answers, and you explain the blue screen of death content that you uh, have experienced. The agent then says and asks, have you switched on the power at the wall socket? What a stupid question. But you won't believe how often that is the cause of the problem. Um, he then wants to know whether this has worked before. Uh, have you tried anything funny? Um, he mentions that he can see the bootloader starting, but that he did not complete. He does not see that it was dehydrated. Um, and then he wants to know whether you're using an HDD or HDD or whether you were connected by IDE, USB, or Firewire. Um, all of this terminology sounds really confusing. So you politely thank me for confusing you, and you decide to call it a... Um, so just a bit of technology problems here. And at the end of all of that, what is the outcome? Was it meaningful, or did you feel this combobulated? Um, IT terminology can be really confusing. Um, but it's also just a grouping of words, just like the words you see on the screen there, those are all normal English, and some people might know what they mean, and other people might not know what they mean. By the way, discombobulated is just a fancy word for confusion, <laughs> and uh, if someone puts you in a state where you don't know, up from down, or you can't spell your own name, then you can say that you are discombobulated. So whether it's IT or whether it's just English, um, in the end it's just terminology, and the fact that things are known or unknown to you. And once they are explained, they become uh, a normal way of speaking. The IT world is filled with a lot of acronyms. Acronyms are just abbreviations formed by concatenating the initial letters of other words, uh, which you then pronounce as a new word. So an example of an acronym is uh, TLA. What is TLA? What does that mean? What does it stand for? TLA is an acronym that was formed by taking the first three letters of those three words. Three letter acronym. So a TLA is actually a self describing uh, three letter acronym. Other examples are things such as CPU, NIC, RAM, USB. All of those are terms that you may 
way or you might not have heard throughout uh, the years that you were exposed to technology. What I intend to do is to quickly take you through a quick summary of what a computing device is. Martin explained the whole thing about this industrial resolution, uh, revolution and uh, the establishing of the information technology sector, um, the technology that we use, and that enables all of that uh, is broken up into a couple of things, uh, components such as hardware, software, and then I just want to speak a little bit about data when we get to the end of, of that, and to explain, mostly explain terminology around. So a computing device. What is a computing device? A computing device is an electronic unit. It is used for processing information and for performing calculations uh, by following a program to perform sequences of mathematical or logical operations. It is made up of a couple of components. Firstly, there's the hardware. Those are the physical components and the wiring of the computer or the electronic system. Um, secondly, there's the software. Uh, there are different types of software. Uh, you find things such as the operating system uh, that runs on top of that, and then there are programs or applications. All of these put together provide you with a data processing capability. And that's actually the thing after when we pick up these devices, so the cell phone that Martin showed us in his first slide. Um, we're not really, we don't really concern ourselves with what the hardware looks like. It's nice to have a fancy phone. But in the end, it's about the data processing capability. We want to be able to read the news or talk to that person on the other side of the world or read the email um, or send the WhatsApp. Um, that's the bit that we, that we are after. The hardware, software, and the data uh, in a computing device uh, has a hierarchy and they are dependent on each other. So there's an order of dependency. If the hardware doesn't switch on, nothing else will. The higher levels cannot function without the lower levels. Once the hardware is there, the software can initialize and eventually one can access the data by either processing it, consuming it, reading it, whatever you want to do with it. So let's dive into the hardware. What is the hardware? The hardware is the stuff that you can touch. Um, there are different types of hardware and hardware means different things to different people. Um, it may be your desktop computer which has a display, um, it has a casing that contains all the other electronics and then there are input devices such as a keyboard or a mouse. It might be a laptop which has exactly the same functionality as that previous item we described but it just has, has a slightly different form factor. It's more portable, it's lighter, um, it can work uh, from a battery, uh, a couple of things that just differentiate it from but it's still hard. It could be your mobile device, which is what Martin showed us earlier, and it could be a tablet, if you have different sizes of these things, still hardware. It could be a light bulb. A light bulb? Yes, a light bulb. A light bulb in the old days had one function, and that was just to enlighten the room. Uh, light bulbs in the future, and especially in the fourth industrial revolution, a revolution that, that uh, Martin will be telling us about, has uh, many other functions that we can, can control in different ways. A light bulb nowadays is actually also a computing device. Inside that light bulb you might find a processor, you might find the memory, and you might find the ability to, to control that remotely. For the duration of this talk, we are going to focus on the desktop device, and I'll use that as a frame of reference just because it's, uh, it's easier to afford to refer to the bits and pieces uh, inside that. What you see there is also a computing device. It is the ENIAC. ENIAC was the first electronic general purpose built digital computer. ENIAC is an acronym, another acronym, IPL, full of acronyms, um, and it stands for Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. Um, it was contracted in 1934 by the United States Army at the University of Pennsylvania, um, and the purpose of that was to generate artillery tables. One year into this project, the mathematician working on the hydrogen bomb became aware of this computer and subsequently became so involved in the ENIAC project that the first test problem that ran, ran on this consisted of computations for uh, the hydrogen bomb and artillery tables. Uh, and not really the, uh, rather than artillery tables, sorry. So that's what a computer looked like originally. Um, 
what does a computer consist of? What are the components? The first thing that you find inside a computer is a motherboard. A motherboard is a printed circuit board, um, and it allows for different bits and pieces of things to be connected. Um, there, are, there are components such as the bus. The bus is an electrical conductor that makes a common connection between several circuits within this circuit board. Um, interesting, that is what it actually looks like. If you look at the physical uh, printed circuit board, uh, being a motherboard, it will be inside of your desktop computer. It's something that you don't often see unless you open the casing. Um, it's, a, a, it's a plane that allows for a lot of con connectivity. Uh, things such as phones also have motherboards in them. You'll see there as an example, it's very, very uh, much smaller, but it still performs a similar function. Um, Phones need a good deal of silicon in these microchips, and of course, uh, plus aluminium in the casing and lithium in the batteries. In fact, a typical modern smartphone uses about 75 of the 118 elements within the periodic table. So, uh, hardware central processing unit. On top of that motherboard that you store there, you, uh, you need some processing. People often think of the CPU or the central processing unit as the brain of the computer. Although, if you think of what a human does with his brain, there are several other things that also happens in your brain. You remember things, you compute things, uh, you control things. Uh, a, compute, a CPU does most of that, but not, not all of it. Um, it executes instructions and uh, that make up computer programs. An interesting thing that you might have heard around CPUs is Moore's Law. Moore's Law is an observation that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit, which is inside an item such as the CPU, uh, doubles about every two years. And this has been going for, for many, many years. Uh, that ENIAC computer that I showed you earlier um, contained about 17,500 vacuum tubes. Later, those were replaced by transistors and miniaturized. And as of 2019, the largest transistor count in a commercially available CPU is about 40 billion. Um, as of 20 years, 2020, the highest uh, transistor count in a, in a graphics processing unit uh, was around 54 billion. What is the difference between a CPU and a GPU? That is an example of a GPU. It's a card that fits onto the motherboard and it is used for high-speed image manipulation. It's a specialized electronic circuit designed to rapidly manipulate and alter memory um, to accelerate the creation of images uh, to display on a device. The term GPU was originally coined by Sony uh, in reference to the PlayStation consoles, the Shiba design, Sony GPU in 1994, as recently as that. Some other components that plug onto this motherboard uh, is, is something called RAM or random access memory. Uh, what does a RAM have to do with a computer? Uh, a RAM that we are referring to here does not look like the picture you see there, but it actually looks like this. Uh, those are also integrated circuits that plug into that motherboard to device for random high speed reading and writing um, at constant speeds. Whereas, uh, Composed to a disk, access is very, very much slower. Um, so a lot of the computations and a lot of the manipulations of data in a computer actually take place uh, in the RAM. And typically that is not persistent when you switch the computer off. All of the information that was uh, stored in there would disappear. So how do you make things last that you store into a computer that they don't disappear? You, you store it on, you know, to a persistent storage device. Uh, you get different types of persi persistent storage devices. Um, this here is an example of a hard disk drive. Uh, it uses a magnetism to store and, and read data. What you see in the picture there are some patterns. And that little icon that looks like a pen uh, is a head that moves around uh, to actually access and uh, transfers the data. Um, Secondly, uh, you get an optical disk drive. Uh, optical disk drive is uh, commonly known as CDs or DVDs. The data is stored on the disk with a laser or a stamping machine that can be accessed when the data path is illuminated uh, with a laser diode. Uh, these optical drives spin at very high speeds. It can be anything between 200 and 4,000 revolutions per minute. Uh, 
to get the data off there. Uh, another type of storage device is a solid state device. Um, that is an example of one. It has uh, integrated circuits inside. There's no revolving or rotating uh, material or platter inside there. Um, it is a solid state drive. USB is something a lot of you might know, uh, or people typically just call it a memory stick. And that is another type of uh, persistent storage. And in this case, it's actually removable. You can plug it in and plug it out and move it around between computers uh, quite easily. What about connectivity? Uh, when that computer is up and running, you need to talk to the rest of the world. You need to be access, able to access the, uh, the camera or the screen from your friend on the other side of the world. You need to be able to read data off the internet. And somehow that data needs to transverse in and out of your computer. That can be done uh, by something called a NIC or a, uh, a network interface card. Um, it is a computer hardware component that connects your computer to another computer network. Uh, it implements different protocols, which are just uh, technical speak for languages. Um, there are different ways of actually getting the data in and out of, of, of these NICs. This example here is an, is an Ethernet NIC, which has a physical wire that connects to it um, in order to allow it to speak to, to other computers' NICs. Um, another way to get connectivity would be through wireless connectivity, um, something that's common that we all have access and struggle with at times is Wi-Fi. Uh, there's no wire involved, but it actually uses radio waves. And there's also from something such as Bluetooth, which you might use to connect your headphones or you might use to connect a computing device to your car's uh, navigation system or sound system. Uh, all of these are just different technologies, all of them providing uh, connectivity between computing devices. Derek, sorry to interrupt. Um, yes, sure. I think you must, um, I mean, we can go on forever here, but I think you must just try to wrap up with the software part. Thanks. Yes, uh, so we're just about to go there. Um, I just quickly want to mention there's also a virtual uh, uh, network connectivity device. Um, uh, it's called a virtual private network. Uh, although your computer thinks it's a device, it's actually not. It provides privacy, security and geolocation. It is widely used in business corporate environments to conduct work remotely uh, in a secure fashion uh, by using encryption from one device to another network on the internet. Uh, it helps to ensure that sensitive data is safely transmitted uh, by preventing unauthorized people from eavesdropping uh, on your communication. VPNs can be used to shield your internet browsing activity from prying eyes on public networks such as Wi-Fi or the general internet. Uh, and it can also be used to access um, the region-restricted uh, websites or, or content. So uh, just a little joke around that. Uh, is my stuff secure? through onto the software side uh, as your hundred request. Software and computers the stuff you cannot touch. Um, it has different layers. There are things such as the BIOS, the operating system. When you boot up the computer, typically you would see a screen similar to the one that you see there. Um, BIOS is another acronym. It is uh, short for Basic Input and Output System. It tests the system hardware, performs some initialization, and then initiates a bootloader that will load your operating system, which might be uh, in some people's case, it might be Microsoft Windows. Uh, if you're a Mac user, it might be iOS or Mac OS, uh, or it might be Android if you uh, have that running on your cell phone. It provides runtime services for operating systems um, and programs. Uh, next, uh, we have some another type of software is applications. Um, applications could be something such as Zoom running on your on your handheld device, uh, Zoom running on your Computer, um, software that you use to access uh, social media sites, uh, the Chrome browser or Internet Explorer that you, you have to use to read websites uh, is another form of an application. Um, mapping software on your PC or mapping software on your cell phone, all of those are examples of applications. Once the hardware and the software is up and running, and the stuff that one really wants to get to, as I mentioned earlier, is the data. That is the real focus. Uh, data refers to the fact that information or knowledge is represented or coded in a form which is suitable for computing or processing. 
and it can then be measured, collected, reported, or analyzed um, and visualized using either graphs, images, reports, tools, videos um, in different, different formats. How is data stored in the computer? Um, it is stored in a binary format, so it doesn't matter how complicated it is or how long it is, um, it is stored as a sequence of zeros and ones. Uh, different patterns of these zeros and ones mean different things to a computer. Uh, there's a couple of examples of what a, a zero, a one, or an A would look like once it's stored in binary. Um, don't be too concerned uh, with the format of that, it's just a quick example. Data um, has a size and it has a volume quantification. Um, those zeros and ones in the computer uh, is called a bit, that is the smallest unit of storage. Um, eight of these bits uh, are typically called a byte. Um, if you have 1,024 of these bytes, people talk about a kilobyte. 1,024 kilobytes will form a megabyte and, and so forth. Um, so if you look at your internet connectivity speed or you look at the size of the hard drive within your computer, um, those are typically the terminology that you would see that being described. With. Data can be stored locally or data can be stored in the cloud. Um, in the old days, we only stored the stuff locally. In our days, it doesn't actually have to live within your computer. It can live somewhere else. And uh, for you to access that data, you would need to, need to upload or, or download the data through your network connectivity to actually process that and then present it to you. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you, Derek. Um, yes, as we said before, uh, if you've got a question, I mean, we can talk on this subject or I can discuss it for a long time. Um, but any questions, just raise your hand. Louise, just, oh, you Hello. are unmuted. I'm, I'm Louise. Okay. Hello, Louise. Just yes. one question. Um, 1,024. Um, can you tell us where does the 24 come from? I always thought it was 1,000. Yeah, so that's just, uh, with me being from a technological background, um, uh, down in the storage devices, it actually is 1,024, and it's, it's because it's a binary or a base 2 system um, that is used. It's not decimal, as us humans are used to, and the way in which that, in that grows, as you use more and more of those zeros and ones, eventually you don't get to a round number of 1,000, but you actually get to 1,024. But to keep it simple, um, uh, in the industry, people just talk about a, a, a kilobyte is a thousand bytes, or a megabyte um, is a thousand kilobytes. Uh, but actually, in the background, it is one hundred two four. But it's it's not important. It's just uh, it's just something interesting that I thought I'd throw in. Now, maybe Louise, if I can just add to that, um, one hundred two four is exactly Derek. Help me two to the power of eight. Something like that. That's why it gets to 1024. Brian, can we take the screen off so we can see everybody? Uh, Derek, you can just stop sharing. Okay. Any other question? Mike, just unmute yourself. I'm unmuted. No other mic. Oh. Yes, Mike. Oh, Mike, I can see you unmuted, but we can't hear you. No, there's a problem on your microphone. Um, you are unmuted, but we don't, we can't hear you. Uh, you're welcome to type your question in the chat panel and I'll pick it up there. In the meantime, anyone else with a question? Les, just unmute yourself. Les, it's over to you. Just unmute yourself. Les, can you hear me? You can talk. You must just unmute yourself. Les, you don't hear me. Anyone else with a question? Die, you can speak. Just unmute yourself. Okay, die. Oh, Dai's question is um, asking, is cloud storage safe? That's a can of worms. Yes, yeah, so 
um, it, it could be, and uh, if it was deployed responsibly, it mostly is. Um, things such as Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, um, there are several of these options that one could use. Uh, a lot of companies such as Microsoft have their reputation to protect as well. So it's uh, to their advantage to make sure that people's data is not at risk when it is stored in uh, cloud storage environments such as that. And typically it would be, it would be encrypted and, uh, and other people would not be able to access that. But you as a user, you're always able to give people access to subsets of that data. And depending on how you utilize it and how you share it, um, your actions could actually cause that uh, to be unsafe. But in a, inherently, the actual cloud storage platform has got everything that it requires. Big banks use it, financial institutions, corporates, um, those organizations would not be using it you know, if, it, if it wasn't safe. So, oh, Jan, we had Les, you could unmute himself again? Les, okay, Les, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, someone else, Bernard, I think I saw your hand, just unmute. heard that um, data stored on some of these devices is not permanent. In other words, it decays over time. In other words, we'll be saving all our family photographs on, on a, a CD disk maybe 20, 30 years from now no longer be usable. Is that, or, or will decay? Is that true that data does decay in these systems? Yes, in the, in the old days when, when magnetic systems were used for storage, um, such as that hard disk drive image that I showed you there, uh, those were susceptible to, uh, to interference. Um, if you were to take a magnet and, and move it across that device and you try starting up that computer or reading some data off that, you, you will most probably find that it had been damaged. Uh, moving to optical storage um, uh, sorted out some of that problems, um, although uh, it has a much longer rack life. Uh, 20 or 30 years from now, the problem is you probably won't have a drive to put that into to read anymore. Um, already in my house, um, all of the computing devices I have, um, I have either disabled or removed, or they never had a, uh, a optical storage reader anymore. So as technology moves, uh, it's better to keep it somewhere in that electronic format. Um, solid state devices, even those, um, they work well, but um, they do decay over time. Uh, they they tend to warn you before before it becomes a problem. Um, but it's over a very very long time. They could be storing data uh, in any of these modern electronic devices, such as a cell phone or such. Um, it wouldn't just yeah. It would be some user user action that would remove the data from. Okay, I think we have to wrap it up. I see there's a question from Cherry, and I'll, I'll have to make that the final one. And she's asking, is it safe to charge my mobile device next to my bed? Derek? <laughs> um, it, 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 it probably is. I think, you know, exposure to, to electronic devices and all sorts of radio waves and microwaves over a very, very long time uh, could possibly be detrimental. Uh, I'm not medically qualified to answer that. But, um, I mean, you, 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 you would probably also be making a phone call and speaking to your grandchild for 20 or 30 minutes on the phone. And then you have it right next to your ear, which is much, much closer than what it is when it's on your bedside table. So I would say you're fairly safe with having a child on your bedside table. Thank you for that response. Thank you, Derek. And yes, uh, I think there might be more questions. I've made a note here, and I think one of our future topics will be about storage in general, and then maybe more specifically also about cloud storage. I'm sure there's many questions from many of you. But for now, thanks, Derek. Um, the next topic is probably not well let me not say it's not intensive but i think it's more a social thing um, it's about social media and now magrit joined us late um, oh um, i see magrit is there now welcome magrit uh, magrit is from bloemfontein and recently only recently moved to somerset west 
with degrees in marketing and business management, she gained intensive experience with a number of highly successful businesses before she decided to go on her own. She qualified herself in the fascinating world of digital marketing and established her own social media agency. Today, she is enabling artists, musicians, politicians, small businesses and individuals to utilize social media to their benefit. And during the lockdown, Magritte was behind many of the online shows and high-level press webinars that were held. I met Magritte during 2018 on her parents' farm near Klokkelaan in the Eastern Free State uh, where she grew up. I was there to produce a video of their luxury guest farm for which she also did the marketing and I immediately realized that she will become a dynamic role player in the field of social media. So we are all ears to listen to Magritte. Over to you Magritte. Johan and thank you for all your kind words. Um, it's lovely to be here and yes I stay in Somerset West now. I'm so happy <laughs> to be here. It's really a lovely place. So um, this morning I'm going to talk a little bit about social media. I've got a few slides here and I'm sure you might have a few questions so I want to go through my slides quite quick. Let's just see, um, I just want to play my slides. Okay, so, um, yeah, social media is such an interesting topic and this is what I do for a living and, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. So, what I've decided to, um, okay, so Jan already gave you my introduction. So basically, after 10 years of working, I fired my boss and I um, hired myself. And I'm just amazed at all the opportunities. And when I started out with um, my social media business, um, I also have little kids and moms and everyone was so scared and saying it's so bad and it's so bad and social media is bad. And I was just thinking, oh my word, I've got an opportunity to work from home. I can be with my kids. I get to connect with people and get information that was not possible before or very hard or very difficult to obtain. So um, what I want to start with is that with everything in life, they are good and they are bad. And I am the kind of person that always wants to focus on the good and wants to be educated enough to um, not get harmed by the bad and i'm sure most of you um, are like that as well so if we think of social media so social media is a place to be social the whole idea of social media was to create a space where people can have a voice where they can share what they feel and where they can share their passions where they can find people with the same interests um, where they can just be who they want to be, express themselves. But obviously, like it is in the, in the real world, there's always crooks and criminals and things. So, because those people are on social media, it doesn't mean you have to totally stay off them. You just need to know where to go and where not to go. It's exactly like living here in Somerset West. It's the most amazing place. But yes, I do have a fence around my house. I'm not going to be stupid and just sit here and thinking, ha, oh, um, there are places we don't go to. And it's exactly the same um, with social media. So it's a place where we can be social. But then what happened is businesses realized, oh, wow, you know, um, if people are there, we can actually um, start advertising to them. And um, let's just go on here. So, and that is why social media became so extremely popular. Because how do these people make their money? Because it's free ads. If we look at Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. So they make their money from people's 
attention. Um, because if your attention is on social media, they can show you ads. And this is how they make money. But it also means that they have to be extremely clever to keep your attention there. Because if they are going to start showing you content you're not interested in, if they are going to allow people to do, do just whatever they want on, on the platform and really make it a harmful place, people are going to leave the platform. And that is why there's always this thing going on on social media um, by them trying to keep their users happy, trying to still make money and trying to get all the crooks off. But like in real life, it's not always possible. So just to give you an idea, I've got some stats here. It is extremely big and it's not going away. It is, it is growing. And I, I've been saying this to people over the last five years and it's sort of as people are suddenly starting to realize, okay, it's not necessarily a threat. It is the change that I need to get used to. And the sooner I get used to it, I can use it for my advantage. Okay, so um, if we look at Twitter, just so, so I was thinking of telling you just a little bit of each platform um, and what it is used for. So basically with Twitter, you can just express, you've got 140 characters and Twitter is extremely popular and the politicians, news people. So it's almost like if it's on Twitter, um, it's, it's relevant news. By the time it's on Facebook, it's sort of, you know, already old news. That's sort of how we look at it. So people, Twitter has got a very big trust factor. Um, but obviously, we have to deal with the fact that every single person in the world, no matter their education level, no matter their intellectual level, no matter their... Um, emotional intelligence level if they've got connectivity they have got the ability to speak their mind and this obviously sometimes creates a lot of problems so before social media um, we only had like newspaper and printed media they were very regulated by the law and um, you know you're not allowed to spread false information or publish any false information but the people on the ground don't always realize these rules also apply to me so the moment i publish a message on twitter on facebook on whatsapp from one person to the other then i fall under the publications act of south africa if it's now south africa and that is the exact same act that governs newspapers and um, and uh, magazines. So you, you can imagine it's a, it's a very strict act and you can get in a lot of trouble for any single thing you publish. Whether it's on a WhatsApp from one person to the next or whether it's on social media. So this is now exactly understanding where not to be stupid on social media. It's really staying within the law. The fact that you've got the power, the exact same power that a media house has or a newspaper, does not mean you can just go and do whatever you want. Actually, so people would say, yo, but does it ever happen? Obviously, people say so many things on social media and, and you know, obviously, if, if they all had to go to jail for what they said, it, you know, that would have been all the police did. The problem is when it happens, it's really, really severe. So it's very important to understand that. Um, so on Twitter, what's quite interesting is, and what I love, you know, like looking at is all the trending, you know, what's trending today. So if you want to know what's going on, you know, what is the sort of digital landscape like in the country, you can go and look at all the um, the handles, especially on, on Twitter. If you follow, for, for instance, we've got trending in South Africa, in South Africa now, Fuchak uh, Fakile, you know, and then you can follow that and you can read what's, you know, what's going on. So um, obviously this was the alcohol ban lifted 
all those who all know about the, the fake news, news that was spread. Fake news is extremely, extremely harmful. And it's very important when you get a WhatsApp with a voice note and you send that to your friend, you can be um, held accountable for that content because <clears throat> how it works in the law is you are in, in, in the line of publication. Sending something, um, you know, is, is actually, you know, putting it out there and that can put you in danger. So this is what I always say, don't be stupid. If you don't know whether it's a fact or not, if you can't verify the facts, don't share it. So, so we see now that fake news has become a very big problem, but it's just because people don't think, you know, you're not just allowed to, to, to do that. And um, so it's very important to understand that. If we look at Facebook, obviously Facebook is the biggest social media network still with the most um, people and it's, it's still growing. But for businesses, it's always good to see what is the next social media platform and obviously Instagram is there. So a lot of businesses love doing business on Facebook, but then we always say, you know, go and explore the other platform because you've got different customers or different kinds of people um, on on the platforms. And what's very nice about these platforms is you don't ha even have to do it for a business. You can have one or other course. So say for instance, you're in horse riding or, um, you know, whatever it is that, that is your course in life that really makes you tick. You can start a, a movement and that is what is so exciting about social media and you can connect with people with the same interests from all over the world. Just to show you a little bit of the back end, so I work a lot with the data we get from social media and how people interact and, you know, um, showing ads to certain kinds of people. So this is more of the back end of Facebook and it's quite interesting because people don't have a clue what is going on. So the Facebook you know and we see it's only the tip of the, the iceberg what's going on underneath the ocean is actually quite incredible it's really an incredible tool um, especially for businesses yeah and then we get instagram so instagram is obviously more visual it's a platform where people share more of their, their photos also a very very great platform for businesses to connect I think this is more or less so i just quickly want to show you so we are very used to um websites now if you look at the information you can get from a website it takes us say three seconds to decide whether we're going to a place or not so this is babylon story this is their website and by the way they've got a beautiful website but um how we have changed in search is we want to get information in the first three seconds. And this is why a social media page is so extremely powerful. So if we look here at Babylon Storen, if we compare the, the, oh goodness, sorry. If we compare the two, let me just get back to my slide. Uh, so if we compare this, the amount of information we're getting here in the first three seconds, versus the amount of information we are getting on their Instagram page is going to determine our decision-making process, whether we are going to buy here or not. Now, if I can quickly show you what happens in the mind when we open the social media um, page of, say for instance, Babylon Stewart. So first of all, let's we see how many other people follow them. Um, this is very powerful because it gives you that um, almost if you don't follow it, fear of missing out. And also there's something going on that you don't know about. Um, you get all the, these are all the videos and highlights. You can see in their bio, we call this the bio. You can instantly see what they are about. And people will um, make decisions on a business's social media page much more than what's going on on their website so we would first go to um, the social media and then if we really still want more information 
read about all the about, then you would go to the website, but then you've already made your decision. So, and then the last platform is um, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is also a very great platform, especially for professionals and for publishing articles. So people always ask me on what platform should I be? And I say, it depends, you know, who you want to hang out with, where you find your interest, um, where you find people you can connect with, and where you feel comfortable, and that is where you should hang out. So this is more or less my introduction on social media. If you want to contact me, this is my email address, but I'm very happy to take a few questions. Bye, Donkey Magrit. Thank you. I think I learned a few things which I sort of avoided over time um, because there's so much of this, but this was very interesting. Any questions? Just raise your hand. Christina, you are welcome. Yes. Um, I was wondering, let's take the famous, infamous Penny Sparrow case. Um, when, when would it have been that she had friends on, on Facebook and one of those people reported her? Or is there some kind of um, system where they pick up keywords um, and they sort of like um, a police, a sort of police that looks for these things, or how does it work? I think the important thing is to understand that um, if it's on social media, um, thousands and thousands of people can see it. If it's if it's face to face or something, it's something that can die die out. So there are a lot of people that say things on social media. But it's sort of like this whole intricate thing. It also depends on the, the um, uh, atmosphere that's going on. So what happens in her case? So yes, she's one out of maybe a million people who's done that. But her case started trending. And that's the difficult thing. Like if no one, it's not that there are people policing it. It's the fact that, you know what, this thing is published. It is governed under the um, public law of South Africa, like any newspaper. So people would post, uh, publish things in newspaper and, and it would just go unnoticed. Until some person notices it and say, but this is wrong, you know, da, 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 da. But with social media, the problem is, um, if it's out there, it's forever. It lives forever. So even um, some of the people who's done things on social media and didn't get in trouble. It can come back to bite them in 20 years from now because the moment you publish it, it lives forever. And I think that's the most important thing to understand. So no, there's definitely not people just policing it or whatever. So we do sometimes have, say for instance, the university, they would have a specialist looking at trends coming up. So the moment they see there's like, you know, something starting to trend, then, then the, um, the specialists would come in and see how are they going to handle this, you know, to try and talk to people, to try and stop that. It's sort of like a fire that starts burning and just goes out. That's why it's so important to understand um, before you publish anything on social media or WhatsApp, ask yourself the question, if I was the editor of rapport would this post or whatsapp or comment on a thread bring me into trouble or not could it bring me into trouble or not and if you always ask yourself that um with regards to racism um de defamation it's very important to understand that you cannot um say things about people on social media because you are publishing it it's the same as a newspaper is saying something about you and it's not based on facts. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Any other question? Penny, unmute yourself. Yes, I wanted to ask you, Mahrib, thanks for an interesting talk. Um, what about cookies? Are there cookies on social media like there are on your web searches? Um, yes, so definitely. How it works on social media, so for instance, Facebook, we would call it pixels. So we, uh, what happens is, for instance, a website has got in, uh, a pixel.
pixel on it, then it reads the information and then people can retarget you on Facebook. But you have to remember, the idea behind it is still to give you a good experience. So I work a lot with Facebook ads and they are so strict. Like, say for instance, you, say for instance, I run an ad to you because of a website you visited and you don't don't stop and read or interact with it then the, it tells the algorithm this is a bad user experience don't show it to more users it's always trying to protect the user but it could be that you really needed this handyman and suddenly this ad comes up so it's making your user experience great because you thank goodness here's a handyman you know i can get and there i call him so the whole idea is to to uh, show you information and ads that will be beneficial to you and your life. So definitely you 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 do get sort of cookie on social media. <laughs> Magrit, thank you very much. Um, and oh, as you heard, Magrit is now a local resident here in Somerset West and she's a specialist in social media. So if it's for your personal um, requirements or your small business, um, Maika, welcome in Somerset West. Bye, Donkey Magrit. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. It was lovely speaking to you all. Great. Today's presentation is what I was told you in the beginning that uh, a practical tip or I did not know that I can do that, that type of, uh, oh, now I lost my screen here. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know I can do that. Now, today's practical tip will hopefully save you some time um, and nuisance. I do it often. I get it often. The tip will show you how to complete and sign a PDF form digitally with Adobe Acrobat Reader. Normally when you receive a form, you have to print it out with your printer, then you complete it by hand, you sign it manually, scan it back into your computer, and then you can send it to whoever sent it to you. Now this tip um, will show you how to do it digitally. You don't have to print it, you don't have to scan it back. I produced a short tutorial video on YouTube that you can follow to learn this trick. It will, it's a three, four minute video. And the link to this tutorial is included in the survey that uh, we're going to complete just now. Sorry, let me... Okay, there my screen is working now. Uh, the link, I'm going to post it now in the chat panel. And you're welcome to open it now. The, the, the link to this survey, you need to click on it while the meeting is still active. Because once I end the meeting, the chat panel will disappear and you won't be able to see the uh, link. So please click on it now, open it in the meantime. And while I close the meeting, you're welcome to start completing the survey. And at the bottom of the survey, you will find the link to this practical tip that I gave to you today. So you should see it now. If there's a problem, anyone who can't see it in the chat panel, you just click on that link and it will open in your internet browser. Okay, in closing, our next meeting is, as we've said, it's always on the last Wednesday of the month. So the next one is on the 30th of September, again at 10 o'clock. The topics will be, uh, firstly, the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and then secondly, terminology originating from the fourth industrial revolution. We'll explain that again. And the third one, the third topic will be about cyber security. So I'm glad to say that uh, Professor Butler and Derek agreed again to cover those first two topics at the next meeting. And I managed to secure a distinct person from the University of Cape Town for the cyber security topic. So I will send you more information in the newsletters that will follow. 
And that is the end of our meeting. Thank you very much for attending. Please complete the survey and submit it back to me.